Um, I just want to welcome everyone <laughs> uh, to the Rural Romp. Um, we're so happy that everyone is able to be here. Um, and I'll do a little introduction of today's event. Uh, the Rural Romp is an annual event hosted by the Rural Planning and Development Department uh, at the University of Guelph. And usually it would be in person and there would be <clears throat> possibly some field trip involved uh, so that everyone who was attending would have a very immersive day um, of learning and interacting with rural heritage or rural topics. Um, but this year we are doing it online, of course, celebrating our sixth year uh, with the theme of rural heritage. So today we're welcoming four esteemed panelists who will be speaking about international rural heritage conservation. They will first go through uh, a short presentation of their background, approach and experience with rural heritage, and then we'll begin the uh, panel style questions. So before we get right into it, uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Please keep your microphone muted for the entirety of the event. Um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat box. And Regan and Holly are going to be moder monitoring this chat box. Uh, we also ask that for the first hour, please keep your video off to ensure that the presentations will flow perfectly with good connection. And then afterwards, please put your cameras back on. We'd love to see everyone. It's, it's really nice to see uh, faces. Um, and now I want to acknowledge that what is now Guelph has had a very long indigenous history from about 11,000 years ago. And it continues to be the home of many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people from across Turtle Island. Guelph is located on Treaty 3 territory, and it's the ancestral lands of many Indigenous peoples, including the Atawandaran peoples, and more recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. As we discuss today, it's important to reflect on the lives and the legacies of Indigenous peoples around the world, and to be a support and ally for times to come. So we wanna get started now with the presentations. Uh, presenters, please try your best to stick to the 10 minutes, but if you go over it, that's, there's no problem. We want quality over quantity as we established yesterday. <laughs> so I would now like to welcome our first speaker to the virtual podium to introduce their experience with rural heritage, Dr. Toki Leoten brown And I'm just going to share. I have some mute. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to share my screen. The presentation. Okay, take it away. All right, okay. Good morning, everyone. And Good afternoon or good evening, wherever it is you're, you know, watching from. And um, my name is Dr. Toki Lauten Brown. So I'm a heritage architect. I'm also a cultural economist as well with Merging Ecologies. And my connection to rural heritage actually is um, a lineage thing. So um, my father is Yoruba from. Um, Nigeria, so the southern part of Nigeria, we have Yoruba and we have the Beninese, and the Beninese from my mom's side. And I remember growing up, you know, well, I was born in Germany, but was taken to Nigeria for my secondary school. So I remember summers in Benin, especially, and I got attracted to the Iya moats, which is why I spent a lot of time researching the moats in Benin. And so the connection for me is more of um, a lineage connection to the lands in Nigeria. Um, next slide, please. So the Iamotes, um, according to oral history, um, was dug around 800 AD to mid 15th century. So it's a combination of moats, walls, ramparts. They extend for more than 9,900 9, miles in all. And it's a mosaic of about 500 interconnected um, sediment boundaries, which 
it's quite interesting that this is not listed on the World Heritage Site. There are, it, it's four times longer than the Great Wall of China. And um, it's, I, it's been said that an estimated 150 million hours of, of digging was used to construct this um, moat walls and perhaps the largest single archeological phenomenon. Well, according to oral history on the planet. And it's, it's very sad to see the state of the moats today. Next slide, please. So this is what it looks like now. It's, um, there's not much maintenance going on with the moats. And as you can see, it, there's a lot of erosion. There's um, a lot of issues with communities not being able to care for the uh, for this moats. And I do remember a lot of um, people coming from um, the UK, you know, to tr I, I think his name was um, Professor Patrick Darling, who tried to work on the uh, moats and get it listed, but it was tough because of um, getting people to be part of the uh, nomination dossier. Next slide, please. So the walls form a contiguous enclosure around Benin City. So Benin, as I said, is in the southern part of Nigeria. And uh, if er anyone knows the Benin um, history, it's famous for its um, Benin bronzes, the artifacts that were um, taken during the uh, invasion of Benin City. And these walls extend outwards to cover the area of the West Ikuba River in Benin City. And so the walls are known, as you can see, there's the outer walls and there's the inner walls. And the inner wall had a primary defensive function and that was to protect the, um, the homes of the chiefs, the um, sacred groves, the um, obas palas and all the um, communal um, areas where um, residents came to, uh, well, commune. <laughs> so next slide, please. So the challenges are a lot at the moment regarding the moats. So it's being used as a catchment area for stormwater. Um, as I said, there are loads of erosions, mudslides, all kinds of things are growing on the moats at the moment. A lot of excavations from um, the communities because they're using the um, um, the moats, the sand from the moats to build their homes, right? So there's a lot of sand dredging. Um, it's also used as a refuge jump, dump. So people go there, throw their stuff. It is terrible. And of course, there's no urban development regarding this. And there's actually no working master plan to protect this heritage. It's, it's, it's actually will be a great loss. Next slide, please. Thank you. I, oh, okay, I thought I had more. All right, so yeah, that's my little presentation regarding the moats in Benin City. Thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs> it's something <laughs> definitely that I haven't heard too much about. So it's it's just so great to have all these different perspectives presented here. And I'm just mm -hmm. so glad that you were able to present this today. Thank you. Um, next, we have Tony, uh, Dr. Tony Fuller. Uh, I will also be sharing your presentation now. If you want to unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself a little bit, I'll get ready with the presentation. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Tony Fuller. I'm a retired uh, professor from the University of Guelph School of Environmental Design and Rural Development. And here is my um, piece of heritage, my sweater that the uh, school had 30 years ago. Um, and I still have it um, today. So I'm a piece of heritage myself. 
from uh, the school of rural uh, planning and development as it used to be called i want to talk about um uh being care i want to talk from a point of view of um advising or suggesting uh, thoughtfulness on behalf of students who may be uh, looking to have a career in um, heritage planning, heritage management, uh, or in the heritage field generally. And my message would be, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. Um, because uh, I'll give you an example, and there are many of these around the world. But I'll give you one example from China uh, of success. Uh, in South China, these are the uh, Aeol Mountains of South China in Yunnan province, um, where there's a world heritage designation for this, re this area of the Hani people. H-A-N-I, the Hani people, are indigenous people. They don't speak Mandarin and they live in the mountains and they have no um, uh, skills to record their history. So there are no documents, uh, only some poems that have been written by modern Hani uh, about uh, memories of the past. So we're dealing here with a, uh, a group of people who can't e interact even with the Chinese, never mind uh, people from outside of China. It took 10 years to get this uh, area designated as a World Heritage Site, and it's become a huge, huge success. Why is it a success? There are many terror systems in the world in philippine in south asia and in latin america and south america there are many forms of terrace agriculture um, using the mountains by carefully contouring the fields to the shape of the hillsides and so forth but this one has a, um, something extra uh, in the early morning, this is a photograph of um, 535 on one January morning when the sun is just appearing over the mountainside. And as soon as it does that, the whole of the landscape in front of you uh, lightens up into a silver color. When the sun gets higher, it will turn to a type of red orange. And then after that, it will go into a yellow color. All around 5.30 to 6 a.m. every day when there are water, where is water in the terraces. There has to be water to reflect the sunlight and produce these colors. So this makes it a bit different than many of the beautiful terraces in other parts of the world. And it's the water in the terraces which are the key um, feature and the whole system is of producing uh, rice and fish in these terraces um, has been going on for well the record is about 450 years so it's um it's a system heritage uh, of looking after this natural feature which has been contoured by the labor of both men and women. In China, women do as much physical work as men do. So it's a, a landscape produced by um, all the villagers. However, success then, be careful what you wish for. The, the, the local governments were delighted the operatives in tourism were given big bonuses because tourism numbers increased exponentially every year. Uh, thousands of people came here to see this wonderful natural um, feature. 
And so slowly, um, the water that drains from the mountain side under the trees um, was used up, not to go into the terraces, but to, to wash the linen and the bedclothes and all the other features, tablecloths and so on, for the tourists who only stay one night usually on average. So every day you have to change um, all the hotel and there's 117 homestay hotels built in the last um, eight years in this area. So the demand for water is huge uh, for cooking and everything else and it's been diverted away from the terraces secondly the labor uh, why work in these terraces and walk down uh, several hundred feet and then walk all the way back with your tools and your bags of rice when it's harvest time and etc when you can work in construction of these new hotels and homestays for four times the um, reward, fiscal reward. So all the young people, men and women, didn't go to the terraces anymore. They went into construction. So we have a labor shortage and a water shortage. So um, the terraces then became, uh, many of them became derelict. So weeds and grasses grew in the terraces, the walls holding the terrace together were neglected and blah, blah, blah. So um, that's a, a success story, but is it? Is it a success story and so on? So in the whole of the designation, the Hani people were not included because they didn't speak Chinese. Uh, or didn't speak Mandarin Chinese. Um, now they uh, become involved. The local prefecture, thank goodness, uh, sent uh, six males, to, men, to um, a college in an outside um, small city where they learned Mandarin. And on the basis of these six people, they created a um, conservation uh, authority uh, to look after the terraces, which has worked extremely well. Um, you might uh, note that they typical of the Chinese way of doing things, that um, all of the buildings which did not conform to um, uh, the local cultural building codes, which were developed uh, that, uh, by these uh, new Hani uh, Mandarin speaking people, um, the hotels were actually bulldozed down if they didn't conform. So there was a huge uh, change in attitude when the Hani people were directly involved. Can you show the next slide, please? So that's what it looks like. At, uh, this was at um, five to six in the morning. It looks like snow, but it's actually um, water. So I hope you like that. It's a very attractive and made, made it um, exceptional, I think, in the terrorist culture. Next slide, please. The result of people coming, however, is this. This on this occasion, when I was there, I was, stayed in a motel, a little hotel on the right-hand side. It took one hour and a half to get out into the street. Nobody's going to let you out. Um, there's nowhere to go. There's no turnaround place. You're on a mountainside and it's extremely scarce to find a place to park a car or a van and certainly not a bus. So the tourism, the mass tourism here was and became chaotic and uh, certainly detracted from the, the, so the pleasure, pleasures of coming here. Uh, next, please. However, the uh, Hani people 
because they could uh, understand their uh, leaders who could speak to them in their own language, but also could speak to the Chinese authorities, they became interested in renovating their homes. They didn't want to move away. And as you can see here, they are putting uh, thatch roofs on their mud brick houses and they excavated the um, uh, rooms at the bottom to uh, which were for cattle originally and very low and people couldn't um, use them but they excavated another one about a foot down and uh, it's possible to use the ground floor so and this is all being done by hani people not by outside authorities, not by big machines that were brought in from uh, Guangzhou originally to build um, viewing platforms and car parks and toilets and all those things that go along with mass tourism. So they've got back to a system of village, local controlled um, uh, tourism. And this time and outside of this village there are the beautiful uh, water filled terraces this place is called Azteque so it raises the question then for for students in particular to think about um, what is heritage here because we're very fond of uh, making heritage buildings the mud bricks and the uh, style of these uh, village homes um, are a, so, a certain sort of heritage. But what about the terraces? Can you classify the terrace system as a uh, heritage? And so what is it really that one is talking about? So all of this together as an integrated system or uh, are there special parts that need special attention? We took um, a multi-stakeholder approach to this, and we found that there were five groups of people who had a stake in this. The Hani people, of course, the uh, local government, and then the local uh, authorities that could speak both Hani and Mandarin. That's the third one. Then there were the people who rushed in to the area and opened up homestays and built um, very standard substandard many times uh, little hotels to take advantage of the uh, tourists who would pay anything uh, to get a bed for the night and a meal and uh, to get rid of their car and so forth that's the fourth group and the fifth group was the outside people people uh, uh, like ourselves would be if we went there to give advice on how to lower the floor, how to reconstruct the, um, in the old style, the um, thatch roofs and so forth. And each of these groups has a different view of heritage. So whose heritage is this? Is it the Hani heritage? Or is it the outsider tourist heritage who wants to see it? And then among the tourists, there's different views of heritage. There are older people who like to come and, uh, and have a tea and talk to the farmers, or the young people who want to um, go for walks in the uh, uh, terrace area along the bankings. You can go up and down, up and down. It's really very dramatic and very nice. I mean, so heritage is a form of consumption. You're consuming many of the aspects of this village and this system of farming and um, who, uh, who uh, heritage is going to be satisfied so who uh, as a planner or a manager uh, which of these various views of uh, heritage is going to be uh, the important ones for you it's easy to designate the terracotta warriors in China as a world heritage uh, site, 
it's clearly outstanding. Um, but, what, but what about a system? This is back to the Niagara Falls question. Do you, can you designate a, a natural feature as heritage? Because who owns that? That belongs to the people. Mm, it's there on the landscape. It wasn't made like the, the warriors. It wasn't built like the pyramids. We didn't have much of a, we just built the terraces on the hillside. So that makes it potentially a heritage uh, site. That's my Hi. little presentation. <laughs> okay. And I do have a comment to make later about um, uh, how to get asset, excuse me, how to get uh, heritage um, thinking moving. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Um, that's a, such an important question that I think will continue to come up during our discussions later on today. Um, but for now, I want to move on to Dr. Timmy Tillman uh, and his presentation also on terraces. Uh, but from an international perspective. So Timmy, if you if you want to share your screen right now and introduce yourself, that would be perfect. Thank you. I am disabled. Oh. Um, okay, you should be able to now. Wow, yes. Can you see? Hello? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Um, I took the, the, the question very personal, uh, where you said, how is your connection to rural heritage? And it's only because I thought about the question that I realized that my whole life I have been dealing with uh, rural heritage without knowing, uh, because my grandfather from my father's side uh, is a um, stonemason or was a stonemason, and from my mother's side was a blacksmith. So for me, uh, this is in the, the called the mountains of uh, Germany. They are not high, but they were called the, the mountain area because they were the closest to the plains of the north. So. It's Bergische Land, and uh, <clears throat> so I have a, a heritage uh, in in my in my genes. You no, know? um, so I took the question of connecting to rural and mountain heritage, and come on, yeah, and I mentioned milestones. Um, which took me all over the world. In, in 79 to 84, I lived in the Mantaro Valley uh, in Peru, and I was the editor of Minca, that was an Andean peasant journal. In 1993, I finished my PhD at the University in Berlin about peasant agriculture and ecology in Jauja in Peru. 2000 to 2016, uh, I worked and lived in Yunnan, uh, in Thailand, in Burma, and developed a program on affirmation of cultures and biological uh, conservation, and uh, working with ethnic minorities, uh, hill tribes, um, and uh, we together with my wife, who's also a Peruvian anthropologist, we, we supported, we accompanied a program called Peace and Food Cultures in Burma, uh, which is passing a very terrible situation now. 2007, 2013, uh, we were hired by the International Institute for Environment and Development in London for a program called uh, and the food sovereignty program, working with uh, highland uh, communities, Quechua and Aymara. And since 2010, we uh, founded in the first World Congress, the International Terrace Landscape Alliance. And this was in Mungzo in Hongha uh, County, no, Hongha Prefecture <clears throat> on the Ailao Mountains. Um, and I'm still the coordinator. It's, uh, the title of this work is about re-enchantment of terrorist landscapes. 
The first step, Minka, uh, living in Huancayo. Um, this um, journal would be published every two or three times per year. And the leitmotif was uh, for an authentic peasant science or Andean science. And we worked with the maybe 10 different uh, cultural artists who you can see the, the, the pictures. Uh, this is just a sample of uh, hundreds of uh, pictures uh, and combined with texts about topics which relate to the uh, rural heritage in agriculture, in ecology, in education, uh, <clears throat> in um, the area of the Mantaro Valley, which is uh, um, Wanka, and uh, we would uh, develop an approach of showing the Andean Cosmovision. Um, and at that time, I was editor of the journal, but also uh, coordinator of the uh, National Coordination Group for Andean Technology. And we organized events about Andean agriculture, Andean animal husbandry, and peasant communication, uh, which led to uh, that local people started to become proud of their own heritage and their identity. Uh, we managed to very diverse themes, but uh, it was uh, the starting point for a movement which exists until today, which I'm not linked to anymore. It's about the affirmation of cultures, uh, Andean culture in Peru. Um, I finished my PhD uh, about subjective ecology of mountain peasants in Jauja. Uh, it's based on 50 testimonies of peasant agriculture. Uh, they said, for example, drought is caused by civil war, the bloodshed of Shining Path, the disrespect of uh, the elders' wisdom by the younger, the younger people, and the climate chaos. This was the study, the, the research was done in 1983, which means they spoke about how these Yankees had destroyed the moon as a sign for uh, projecting the harvest because they had uh, went to the moon. So they had stepped on the moon and then it was destroyed. So they are work a lot with ethnoastronomy and the prediction of climate and harvest. And this is uh, unfortunately, um, let's say difficult. They have to adapt new, new ways because the old customs do not, uh, are not true anymore because of this uh, industrial system. Um, <clears throat> then I went uh, to Asia. I went about 20 years in, in so sometimes living there in Kunming or in Yuanyang or uh, in Chiang Mai in Thailand or going to Burma. Um, and here's an example of uh, we published a, a book about participatory action research embracing the knowledge perspective within field research for the University of Chiang Mai. And it's actually, if you look at the picture on the right side, there's a picture of a woman which describes how the placenta is located on a tree uh, of a newborn child. And this tree becomes the brother or sister of this uh, little girl or little boy. And this tree cannot be cut so it doesn't enter into the shifting cultivation, for example. And on the left side, you see the vision of the future of Burmese uh, NGO workers and uh, local leaders, uh, which create an image of uh, um, solidarity, of link with nature, uh, Buddhism, etc. One uh, very important topic, uh, which uh, I think is, is uh, crucial, is that we learned about shifting cultivation and we organized several meetings on shifting cultivation as it is the supermarket of the people, because in these fields, which is 
uh, rice uh, in, in, in rain fed fields. Um, it is growing within the 10 years it is uh, afterwards follow about 250 different food crops. So it is a, an immense area and we cannot uh, say this is forest, this is uh, shifting cultivation forest. Uh, they have their natural forest, uh, which is not touched, but the diversity is in these uh, human-made uh, fields. <clears throat> and uh, here you see, this is the contradiction between the foresters, which were educated by German foresters, uh, who worked for the British in the uh, British East uh, Eastern Company, uh, and they created, based on the German forestry system, the system of tropical forestry in Southeast Asia, in Burma, in India, etc. And uh, there's the contradiction that all the foresters are against this shifting cultivation. They think this is slash and burn and should be uh, uh, abandoned. And we think you have to uh, respect get to know the knowledge of the people and start working from their perspective. Just, just an example, all the examples, if you take education, if you take all the fields need, uh, as uh, Tony was saying, needs to de decolonize. No? Um, then, <clears throat> uh, together with Michel Pimbert from Coventry University, uh, we uh, were in charge of a program, Food Sovereignty in the Altiplano in Peru, near the Lake Titicaca. And we worked with these farmer representations, graphics, testimonies. And in the bibliography is a, a virtual book, which you can download in English and in Spanish, uh, with all the different drawings and videos, etc., which were achieved uh, in in that uh, time, uh, we supported a network of wise elders from about eleven communities, Aymara and Quechua. And um, what you can see on the right is uh, a teacher from the community Aymara in Perca. Uh, the teacher on the left uh, left side with a brown hat. He interviewed the old man uh, about the science for agriculture. And he was drawing this and this, and then uh, Florentino said, oh, I never knew about all this. I will use it next week in my class in the school, you know? because it's, it's the sign of ethnoastronomy. It's about animal behavior, etc." cetera. <clears throat> um, and here's some way the, the, the action research where people describe and draw their situation. They have never been drawing in this way. And we just ask them, please show us what is growing in the fields and they, they draw it. And then there is an exhibition and during the exhibition is a discussion uh, where they decide what action to take. So it's, a, it's an action oriented process and it takes uh, some time to, to do it. Um, in part of this, program in, in, in the Andes was that we asked the farmers to describe what they think, how they should deal with the scientists. So uh, here, uh, Don Rufino, for example, he made this uh, construction where he said, this is the link with the scientists. We in our fields and they in their cities. You know? And uh, we need to discuss uh, uh, with them establishing a bridge, a bridge for understanding. And what you see on the left side is the encounter of animal uh, scientists with the alpaca breeders. And they exchange their, their points of view about how the colors come and the scientists proposing for the agro-industry, for the uh, wool industry to create animals which are white. And the farmers say, no, we want color because they are stronger, they are nicer, we can use them. So uh, the, it's a whole methodology, wisdom dialogue. Then I came to 2010 to the, <coughs> uh, through UNESCO, we were asked to facilitate and organize a Congress on terrorist landscapes in Mengzi. Uh, I have been working in, in China with the Academy of Science in uh, Kunming and um, 
So I knew the area, it was a project area with the European Union on poverty alleviation uh, along the river, uh, the Red River. And uh, <clears throat> then we founded uh, the um, uh, the International Terrestrial Landscapes Alliance. What you see here, the picture, it's not honey. Uh, this is ye, because the extraordinary thing is on one side, the ones who asked for their recognition as World Heritage Site were honey intellectuals living in Kunming, yeah, four people. They went and said, this is, we need the help. And the leader of the prefecture, who is also ethnic minority, uh, I think in that time he was uh, by, uh, <clears throat> they spent money to make this conference and achieve the uh, World Heritage Site. Uh, but the interesting thing is that this area is managed by seven different ethnic groups. So they need to understand each other, they work together, and they uh, to establish this. Now, tourism is a big problem because uh, they don't want that on these fields is uh, rice growing because then you don't have these uh, nice pictures. So we found it. Uh, here you see on the right, uh, this uh, ye lady drawing her, what are the crops growing in, on her fields. <clears throat> then we had a Congress in Cusco and we always uh, uh, invite and, and have the, um, uh, the protagonism of the terrorist guardians and the shamans, etc. This is uh, our friend Ippolito, he is doing the offerings to the mountains so that we have a successful Congress um, in 2000. And you see on the right side down, this interaction between scientists, activists, government people, and a lot of farmers. We had from the 250 participants, about 100 farmers, peasants, mainly from Peru, but also Bolivia and Ecuador. Um, now within uh, ITLA, uh, there are many activities. We had uh, a Congress in Italy and the Canary Islands, etc. But here you see some of the uh, uh, initiatives for rural heritage. On the left side is the meeting of the German section of ITLA, where they reconstruct walls, um, they discuss, uh, they present their experiences. And these are people from Central Europe, not only Germany. Uh, and of course, terrace areas in mid central Europe are always wine regions. So we enjoyed uh, very much, we enjoyed a lot. On the right side, you see in the top, one example of initiatives which uh, do the re-enchantment of the terraces. And this is, for example, there, these are a, a scarecrow competition in Japan on rice fields. And uh, this is a design professor who created this and every year they make a competition with the students and uh, uh, they're putting on the fields with the farmers and then they decide which one is the best. Or you have all the stone wallers down there. Uh, this is in this uh, city of Cortemilla because uh, the stone walls have been declared also intangible um, uh, heritage <coughs> in, in uh, the Mediterranean region. And uh, there are many schools now and construction courses to rebuild uh, the terraces because the terrace is uh, an outstanding system. It's not a marginal system. It's not a poverty system. The terraces are the most excellent production areas, but as the agro-industry has problems with it because they cannot mechanize, it's uh, hard work and so, they say, no, no, this is marginal area. This is uh, not useful, etc." So uh, we are trying to change uh, uh, the view about this and have recognized that uh, why the Romans created uh, terraces all over Europe because uh, they could not live without good wine uh, because maybe water was poisonous, no? <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, we hope Bhutan 2023, that we will have the next Congress. And it's about um, decolonizing our concepts because 
um, I will explain it later. And Bhutan um, offers, when we went there, we asked the scientists there, the agronomists, uh, do you have a specialist on terrace land and terraces? Uh, and they said, no, no, in Bhutan, it doesn't exist. No. And when we went out, all Bhutan agriculture is on terraces. So that's why everyone is a specialist and not, there's not one specialist in this. And when we proposed to hold the Congress uh, in Bhutan, the, our colleague from the university, he asked the ministry, could we organize the Congress? And they said, oh, interesting idea. We never thought about this. So <laughs> this is a very uh, important step and we are organizing uh, Itla Caravan from the 35 countries we, we are doing with different uh, activities. Stop share, oh, how can I stop share? Please stop, <laughs> my mouse is not reacting. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much to me. <laughs> There was a lot of information there that we're going to unpack later on in the in the panel questions, um, but uh, I think we have to move on now to Mario. Um, he was in a meeting before this, so sorry he wasn't spotlighted here before. Um, and Mario, if you would like to um, share your screen, or I can do it as well. That's okay. important. Thank you. Now I can share my screen if you don't mind. And uh, thank you so much for this in kind invitation from Holly and from yourself to share some of my um, you know, knowledge or wisdom. I don't know how you call it. And, and I thank all the other panelists. I'm sorry I'm coming late. I had an ICOMOS video meeting just before that. And I was so uh, so I, I, I took the question number one in a different way. And um, uh, because I am, I am actually a city person. I, I was born in a big city in South America and I have been living in cities since then, but I had the opportunity to be an exchange student long time ago in a rural area of Belgium. Uh, and I saw some of our colleagues were mentioning, you know, actually when, when you asked this first question about what is your connection to rural heritage, I was really asking myself, did I have any connection or not? And then I realized the big connection that I have. So one, I am an academic, so I am a professor at Carleton University. Um, I am a volunteer because I, I am Secretary General of the International Council of Monuments and Sites and also the Association of Preservation Technology. And I, I work very heavily with different networks in, in the heritage uh, sector. And I have been a consultant for UNESCO and the Getty Conservation Institute among others for many years in which we have collaborated in many rural areas. I'm a heritage recording specialist, so I'm not going to be very I'm going to be a little bit more technical in my, in my intervention. Uh, I will be talking mostly about what is my experience and what I think is important. And I actually, so I have, let's say like two main core expertise. One is how to record a site to be, you know, to be enjoyable for the present and the future to kind of uh, transcend my lifetime. And uh, in that particular, it has, I have been working in several uh, sites across the world, many World Heritage sites, but also normal sites across uh, countries. And also I have been invited in many occasions to talk about inventories and how we can capitalize on the identification of cultural heritage. And I wanted to bring some things to your attention. So this is, so back in the time, in 2009, I had the opportunity to map the island of Meroe, which is a World Heritage site in, in Sudan. And I was very shocked when I saw this uh, German truck, I'm sorry for my German colleagues, uh, full of tourists driving to an archeological site. And then here, of course, we can directly blame the, you know, we can blame the authorities. Uh, we, I mean, we can blame the tourist operator that is not taking care of archeology, span but also equally important for our, you know, governments, whatever they are, international, federal, provincial, citywide, municipal wide is the identification of those resources because how people can know the society if we don't have a clear identification of those boundaries and where those sites are located. And in this case, that archeological site was not located. Then I have been working in the Sultanate of Oman 
and this is something that shocks me a lot, is the aband abandonment of urban architectural villages, entire villages throughout the, throughout the country which are completely abandoned. And then here, who is res whose responsibility is this? Well, it's difficult to say because one is that the, the people that were living in these settlements want to get more comfort. So they want to live in air conditioned cabinets uh, made out of reinforced concrete. So what do we do with these traditional villages that have such a importance in the uh, uh, architecture and significance and by preserving them? So that's another issue. Abandonment is not only saying, well, this group left, so what are we going to do? Uh, we also have a lot of negligence and lack of maintenance. I think that we identify heritage resources, but then we kind of neglect them or not uh, maintain them properly. And this is one out of many thousands of churches in Peru, which are really wonderful places located in rural areas, but the communities do not have the funding to be able to maintain and do the upkeeping of these sites across the world. So I don't have many answers to you. I will give you, uh, I will give you some leads uh, throughout my presentation. So one aspect that I'm always asked is about inventories. And this is a, a, um, a, a graph that comes from Peter Stone, who is the chief of the Blue Shields Committee in the UK. And he says that heritage inventories have to be accurate, accessible, complete, and secure. Now, do we need these in all our inventories? I don't think so. And do we, Peter actually says in this article that he published for the Getty Conservation Institute that, that these are all aspirations, that many of the inventories do not need this. So if we don't are able to identify the sites and record them, then what can we do? Now, from my experience, a heritage recording tools have become more and more accessible for people to utilize to identify those sites in a, in a good way. So I, I know I have a short of time, so I don't want to be very sensitive in this. But you see, these are little drones. I like a, a lot flying drones around. And we use them a lot for, uh, for rapid documentation of sites. And I will show you some examples. And then we have like these 360 cameras that we also use to provide some kind of in, semi-immersive experience to people visiting uh, sites. And I think that these two tools and also cell phones can be very effective in this type of approach. And this is actually the camera that I use. It's a very simple camera where I can take panoramic images. And I was actually looking, we have a colleague from MIT, Carmelo, who is a good friend. And he has this passion about, uh, because he's from the south of Italy, and he has this passion about mapping, a, you know, rural villages in, 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 in Sicily. And he's been using this type of cameras, just walking around with a helmet and he puts the camera on top of his head and we records a steep amount of, of villages throughout Sicily. So I was just thinking that these are kind of things that I see my students doing a lot. So can we implement this type of thing? And then of course, if we do panoramic photography, we can do this kind of tool. So this is just a basic tool of one of the uh, ruins in the NCC park here near Ottawa. And this is done, so this, this uh, aerial image that you see has been done with the drone. And then these images that you see more earth uh, sites are done with the little camera that I can give you. And just by showing you this little video, I can just show you how these, uh, these wings uh, in, 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 in the park of Gatineau uh, look like. So I think that technologies are bringing a lot of opportunities. Of course, there are other challenges about posterity and you know, quality, etc. But I think that these are things that we can explore in, in rural uh, mapping rural heritage, specifically, specifically in our country and in other countries. So uh, these are some examples of some of our work. So this is a map of the Casa, Ca, Casa which is actually uh, is is a is a kind of village next to a fortified Casbah uh, in the south of Morocco. And in this case, you can see we were mapping all the public spaces and streets, but then we have no access to the community buildings for obvious reasons, privacy and so on. So we kind of did this map to be able to understand the urban morphology of this village. This is a picture of a condition assessment of a, using an orthomosaic of the 
Church of Independent Peru, which is also located in a rural area. And in this case, we were working for the Getty Conservation Institute to map the conditions of this church in view of the restoration. And this is a quick overview of the documentation of Harat al Balit, which is a settlement in Bana, in Mana Oman, which is abandoned and is being taken over by a group of uh, architects from Oman who are very conscious about the, the site. And we were mapping this on behalf of the Getty, uh, which they organized a training course there. And you can see we use a simple drone, some aerial images, and we were able to map in a matter of two of a week, and then about one month and a half processing, we were able to produce some nice orthocorrected images of the layout of the, of the village, and then a three-dimensional view of this point cloud that we generated from the drone using some sophisticated photographic tools. And then these were the areas that the participants to the training were studying. So you can see how information technologies are kind of interesting. And this is just a three-dimensional view of the point cloud of a specific area where we were working. And this is a more detailed uh, aerial image or the corrected aerial image of one part of the village. So you can see that how technology can be able to map sites in a relatively short time. Now, there are some other questions um, that I think that we're going to answer next about during our career, what has been our perception. So I'm going to leave those for later. Uh, finally, I would like to talk about ICOMOS. So in ICOMOS, we have the ICOMOS IFLA. We, IFLA is our landscape committee, scientific committee on cultural landscapes. And they talk about principles concerning rural landscapes and heritage. They establish, they establish the terminology used in rural heritage establish some guidelines for the conservation. So I invite you to visit the ICOMOS website for that. I also invite you to become a member of IFLA or CIAF, which is the Vernacular Architectural Committee. They have a program called Vernadoc in which they do recording of vernacular architecture in rural areas, in particular in rural areas. So I invite you to that. And then last year, we had an ICOMOS, in, no, three years ago, I'm sorry, we had a, an ICOMOS symposium, Rural Heritage Landscapes and Beyond. And here you can see the full proceedings accessible to everyone. So in ICOMOS, we have a particular interest in rural heritage. So I invite you to become an active member of our national committee. So I think that this is all for me and I, I'm looking forward to the discussions that we will be having uh, later. So thank you again for, your, for this opportunity to share my, my opinion. And I'm going to try to stop sharing. <laughs> uh, yes, please. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Mario. And um, I just wanted to bring to attention that Dr. Toki is also um, part of uh, ICOMOS IFLA, and she represents Ireland and Nigeria, I believe. So if you haven't met already, you probably will run into each other at some point. <laughs> Um, and I'm just going to pass the mic over to Regan now, who will be asking the panelist questions and moderating the panel. So thank you all. Thanks, Sampurna. Um, so Holly Sampurna and I have prepared some questions, which Mario provided a brief overview in his slideshow there. Um, but just for everyone in the audience, if anyone has questions, this would be a perfect time to put them in the chat. I know Holly's been monitoring um, and we'll turn to audience questions at the end here. Um, so feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, in a few minutes. Um, so our first question is, what is the biggest challenge you've faced or come across in rural heritage planning? And I know everyone's kind of hinted at different challenges as they were presenting, but maybe if you just want to talk to one of the, the biggest challenges that you've come across, and we, we can start with Dr. Toki, um, if that's okay. Um, yes, okay, challenges. There are quite a lot, uh, you know, especially in Nigeria, there's quite a lot. And one of the biggest challenges will definitely be funding or access to funding. And um, in my work, I've seen that um, before you can get um, communities or custodians to be involved in any research or take part in you know, anything, they, the first question they will ask you is, how much are you paying? <laughs> so they don't understand, oh, you're a researcher or, you, you know, you're, you're a document. They, they're not interested in, in that because 
as far as they're concerned, if you want a piece of that, you should be able to pay for it, right? And so that's one of the biggest challenges I get on the ground. Then it's working with government officials that are supposed to be maintaining sites. That's another challenge. It's either they understand or they don't want to understand or they're just plain difficult. And they're not ready to take active roles as stakeholders of heritage assets. Only if it brings tourism and it brings money. Now, if you start a, if you start a conversation and you say, oh yes, there's a win-win situation and yes, it will bring tourists, then you see them sitting at the table. And those are the two biggest challenges I've seen on the ground, literally. And I find that once communities are, um, okay, the uh, Hanslow hierarchy, once they, uh, you know, they're, they have food in their belly, money in their pockets, they will take custodianship of heritage assets to a whole new dimension. But until that is addressed, they don't see the point. And that would be, you know, my two cents on question two. <laughs> and that's uh, apart from all the heritage site um, challenges you see, you know, with erosion, climate change, now with COVID, apart from that, yes. Tony, did you want to add on to that? <laughs> 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 well, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I think in different cultures there would be different concerns, but the, the first concern is not to preserve the heritage, it's to improve life. And um, so the link uh, between heritage uh, development for uh, to bring tourists or to bring some form of improvement of, the, of life is, um, is probably essential. So I, I, I think it's, that's a very, very good point. Deal with the people's problems uh, before superimposing our um, ideas about what mm -hmm. would make good heritage. Mario. Mario, did you want to? Well, I, I think that, you know, my fellow panelists have mentioned very important points. You know, one is the funding. I, I find that that's probably the most challenging one is that I give you an example. So we have been talking to Syria a lot uh, after the, you know, the destructions of conflict. And the country of Syria has uh, received millions of dollars for the restoration of Palmyra but then zero funding for the conservation of vernacular villages that were also heavily affected by war. So uh, here you can see that there is a matter of, uh, of priority, right? What is it more visual for the funding agencies? And it seems like rural heritage is not very visual for those funding agencies. So that's something that we, I think that we partially have the responsibility because we have to we have to confirm that those are also very important aspects. I had the opportunity to visit some Chinese villages that were also called rural, but then again, I, I, I shared Toki's view because they were, they were kind of staging those villages for attracting tourism, you know, to create a funding opportunity, right? And then what I mentioned about the Sultanate of Oman, which is a village, I mean, the villages are really important and they're completely abandoned. Some of them are now utilized by, you know, uh, cheap labor people that move to Oman to look for other opportunities. They are cheap labor, so they work in different industries where the early pays are very low wages and they live in these villages. So how can we collaborate with people, you know, who are migrating and taking over these areas? So I think, I mean, I am not an anthropologist or a sociologist, so I will be very, it will be bad if I will start talking on how to incentivate people in, in villages to take care of their heritage. Uh, 
but but I, I would I would be glad to hear some opinions from others. Right? Yeah, if anyone wants to to join in on on what Mario was just discussing, I think all of you have talked to this to some extent, and it goes back to to Dr. Toki and Tony's first comment there about looking after the needs of of communities first. Can I share my screen? Yes. Yep. Yeah, I, I prepared um, another slide for each of the questions because I think it's easier than inventing just from my brain. <clears throat> and uh, of course, there are lots of challenges, and this is from the point of view of the terrace landscapes. But we have a, a, a thing in in the mentality in the in the mind, um, which I've called below the colonized mind. Uh, because the discussions about terrace landscapes are dominated by urban views or plain views versus rural or mountain views. I think if we have a paradigm shift, then we, we take different decisions. If we look at it from the point of view of the people and their, their life quality, their well-being, the summa causa, for example. So if you do this, then it's obvious that we don't want chemical, we want more organic. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we come to the question, who dominates and decides? And um, uh, Boaventura de Sousa Santos has uh, created uh, or written several books, but one is about the epistemicide. That is the non-recognition of the value of uh, local knowledge systems of uh, local wisdom and to come and invade with uh, the external knowledge these these local systems we have about 7000 languages in the world 7000 different cultures and they all constitute uh, an epistemic community and uh, it is one community which dominates the rest so we need to have more respect to the the, the local uh, knowledge. And this is to change the view from a different uh, perspective. That's all, all now to share again. Okay, so just to, to keep the conversation moving, we have about 15 minutes left. And I wanna go back to something Tony mentioned earlier. Um, and then I'll pass it over to Holly for audience questions. But Tony, you mentioned how to get heritage thinking moving and wanting to discuss about that. And I'm wondering if the other panelists also have some ideas about how to get heritage thinking moving or, or what is the, how to, how to put energy or momentum behind that. Oh, Tony, you're muted. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, there's obviously many ways to animate the process. First of all, heritage planning is a process. I think that's been well illustrated this morning that, uh, with different examples of how long and, and sensitive it is to um, really uh, bring um, uh, humans into the heritage conservation, preservation, um, ethic or ethos really. Yes. One way that I found uh, to be successful is um, very similar to um, what uh, Timmy was, has demonstrated in different locations, different environments, and that is the sort of um, direct consultation with the people. In, immediately by going into, a, into an area uh, a village or uh, agricultural region, whatever. Um, one is an outsider coming into a an existing cultural uh, position, and a good way to do this is rather than take the standard international process of saying what are your needs in heritage preservation, uh, to switch it around on the other 
the other way and ask um, what are your assets and do asset mapping and uh, it's surprising how that brings many different sorts of communities together or factions within one community can discover that other people in their same village um, have similar ideas or similar values and uh, and this you know can start a very positive uh, affirmation of what it is that's important to them uh, what is their heritage so if you want to discover what community heritage looks like you, you've got to find we've got to find ways like asset mapping or other ways too to um, uh, enable people uh, to change their thinking about what's important rather than what it is that they need the need can come later in uh, actually um, doing something about the assets that they think they have and they want to keep and they want to improve on so uh, i just wanted to mention that the asset mapping that i've been involved with in about uh, eight or nine different cases um, all proved to be um, not the same but they all proved to be positive in different ways and uh, it was very um, rewarding and they take control of, of it then they know what they want they know what's important and as an outsider you are then um, helping them they're not helping you you've got to switch the them and the you around if possible thank you Thanks, can, I, can, I, can i drop in the question is whose nostalgia is it whose nostalgia are we um conserving or preserving is it the ones that you know the community the communities feel strongly about or is it the one the governments feel will bring tourism <laughs> well that that would be my question or oh, questions <laughs> yeah that's a really great question to think on and i think it comes back to decolonizing um heritage and heritage conservation Timmy or mario did you have something you wanted to add well i, I like that word about nostalgia so basically we want to you know we as city guy wants to go to the rural heritage and see it as it is in the past right which is not actually what happens you know? so uh, yeah I, well i always think about that active reuse of what is actually basically we want i mean a building without a function is a building that is going to die right so yeah i, I agree with Toki <laughs> on that aspect Jimmy, i see your microphone's on yes um <clears throat> i had a, a a list of possible actions but i want to choose and can just explain it um, when I listened yesterday to the Canada expositions um, presentations, I wondered um, it's too much focused on preservation in the sense, um, and I sent a, a message about a position presented by Jaime Izquierdo in Spain. It's a relatively new book um, here. And it's called the Agropolitan City and the Cosmopolitan Village. Because he says, for the human humankind to survive, we need cities that in the future become agrarian, that they take over more values and uh, processes from, from the village. Uh, and to make the village interesting is that you must have cosmopolitan villages. That means uh, I live in a village. Uh, I produce potatoes. I, so I, I live, you know, I'm not urban person, but uh, at the same time, uh, it's a way in a group of people, we call it the re-enchantment of, uh, of nature, the re-enchantment of the landscapes uh, of our lives. And this is what um, um, Jaime Izquierdo is, um, 
is presenting as uh, an option for the future. Not only thinking of preservation of heritage is something people in the city are doing for those outside. We have to change in the cities. We cannot survive like this. Uh, you saw the pictures from Hunghe, where even in the rural village, they have traffic jam, no? So, uh, I mean, it's, it's just stupid, but uh, it's interesting that uh, we have different processes occurring. Uh, the increase of um, 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 small farmers in different uh, parts of the world because they are going back there. They are looking, oh, it's better to live in the countryside than live in the city. No? Um, the, the pandemic has brought that in Peru, more than 1 million people left this, the city of, of Lima, Arequipa and Cusco went back to their villages because they were in the informal sector. They had no work, they had no food. So they went back and started to produce, but they had conflicts because they brought the pandemic. They also uh, started to produce on land, which was in hands of others. And so it's, it's not easy, but at the same time, there is a, is a movement back. So I think um, it's not a question of how we can give the people, um, um, let's say, a, a better future. It's the people themselves who, uh, and this are the process we have been doing with farmers that they uh, recognize their own values, their own knowledge, that they, that they are proud of it and that they start arguing and that they are saying to the government, oh, uh, you're coming here, you, you want to exploit us, and we need this, this, and this. So to make them stronger in their belief to stay in the village and not have the feeling, I'm a, a marginal person, I need to uh, go to the city, etc. but to be proud and, and have this uh, identity. And this is part of what, uh, there was a question of, of how to decolonize. When you uh, prioritize your own concepts and you learn from uh, let's say, to recognize the value of the mountain gods in, in your community, then uh, you are much better ad uh, adapted to your conditions than the person from the city who doesn't know anything about it. You know? So uh, for survival, and this shows the pandemic now, you need skills which were needed 500 years ago, 200 years ago, and not the skills which, and what we have to do is, maintain these skills, but also uh, look into the offers which the modern society can, can, can offer. Everyone has a mobile phone, so everyone can take a picture and send it. You know? And so we, we can register, we can be more democratic uh, in our society. Thanks, Timmy. That's a lot of really great insight to think about. Holly, just in sake, for the sake of time, I'm going to pass it over to you so we can get some audience questions in. Yeah, I think that that's great. I'm, I'm one of the questions in here, and I, I think like everyone's hinted at it. Maybe we can explore it a little bit, it, a little bit more. Is um, just about your experience um, being able to decolonize people's minds, or or the this whole idea of um, decolon uh, decolonizing. Um, there's a, the, a message here from Lori Smith where she's talking about, are we listening to some local voices and not others? And how do we reconcile that? So I don't know um, if, if someone wants to, to jump on that. Tony? Well, oh. No, no, you were unmuted before. So small, these icons. Um, <laughs> uh, th this is a, a wider issue over, overall, um, how to, um, uh, to get groups of people or uh, differing groups of people to, um, uh, to coalesce and to bring out their, um, uh, they can participate, but participate in a way which leads to their um, empowerment and to their group um, growth, as opposed to serving the needs of us as students or researchers or as um, architects or uh, uh, technicians of one sort or another. So um, 
it's to to get away from uh, heritage planning as an expert driven enterprise and turn it around into a community uh, development enterprise as much as, as as is possible and there's a lot of literature in the community development field which could be um, employed here uh, it doesn't have to be reinvented by the um, uh, heritage tourism planners in, in my in my opinion it's it's a it's a process and it takes a long time i'm very very impressed with timmy's approach uh, beautiful um, involvement, engagement of the local people who discover all sorts of things about themselves and even in the few pictures that we saw. Um, but this is difficult to do with governments who don't have those sorts of timmies in their ranks. Um, we don't have time to train uh, everybody to be able to do that in such a sensitive and careful way. Um, uh, anthropology isn't a common uh, uh, skill, uh, generally speaking, among uh, us all. So um, my response is, um, it, it's it's just not very easy. But we, I think we should borrow some of the well-known techniques from community development, community planning, mm -hmm. uh, and engage uh, uh, effectively to empower the community, not to empower ourselves. I think that's a great, a great message there. Um, anyone else want to uh, hop on that? Um, I think another thing that that a question that came up that's sort of sort of related, um, although we're we're kind of running out of time. Actually, we are out of time. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of great questions. And so maybe what we can do is, is follow up with our guest speakers and, and see if they have any resources they'd like to share with, with attendees that we can get out to, to all of you. I'll throw it back to Sampurna just to wrap everything up. And uh, thanks all for your great questions and great responses. Sure, thank you, Holly. Um, yeah, we're so sorry that we did run out of time today. Um, but um, as Holly mentioned, uh, we are working towards uh, putting together a whole list of resources along with the recording of this event. So if anyone missed out or if you want to share it to anyone, uh, they'd be able to see the see what happened uh, today at the at this event and also read more about um, each of your uh, perspectives and experiences. So with that, uh, I officially am concluding uh, the rural romp of 2021. Um, very special year for the rural romp um, and I just also wanted to mention that we're trying to uh, keep this project going as like a legacy project for this year and so we're asking all our participants if they'd like to share a photo uh, with the narrative uh, or an experience um, that they've had in a rural heritage site or any kind of rural heritage experience to send it to us and we're mapping it together and displaying it all together. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I will be um, sticking around here for a little bit if anyone wants to talk or uh, just hang out. But thank you so much for all your presentations. This was lovely and we're so, we're so lucky to have you uh, present to us today. <laughs>